Welcome to Indiana University Southeast and to the Ogle Center. My name is Kirk Randolph and I'm the director here. And I am so delighted to have you all here today um, as we all join to celebrate this very exciting day for Indiana University Southeast and for the arts in Southern Indiana. I would like to introduce our panel for today's conference. To my right, Kathy Russell Smith, granddaughter of James L. Russell, followed by her husband, Don Smith. To his right, Chancellor Ray Wallace and Rob Koenig, development officer. Today is a representation of a lifetime of passion for the arts and the vision of a family to preserve a collection with regional significance. Many people have been involved making the James L. Russell Wonderland Way collection a reality. I would like to recognize Kyle Rinout, my predecessor and friend who initiated the conversation with the Smiths and who introduced me to this amazing couple. I would also like to recognize several people in the audience. First, our IE Southeast students, if you'd raise your hands. Thank you all so much for being here. David Smith, Don, uh, Kathy's and Don's son from Denver, Colorado. Members of the Ogle Center Advisory Committee who are here today, if you'd please stand. Jack McHuron, Millicent Stiefler, and John Hartstern. Thank you all so much for being here. Vice Chancellor for Administration and Finance, Dana Wobble. Vice Chancellor for Enrollment Management and Student Affairs, Jason Merriweather. Sherry Rouse has not joined us yet, but she will be coming from um, IU. She is the Curator of Campus Art. Brian Jones, pro Professor of Fine Arts in the School of Arts and Letters. Stephen Krolak, Director of Marketing and Communications for IU Southeast and Kendra Barnes, communication specialist and editor for IU Southeast. Thank you all so much for being here today. First, a little bit of history. The Wonderland Way was a stretch of highway that ran from Cincinnati, Ohio to Mount Vernon, Illinois, that was created to promote tourism in the region. In the 1920s, a group of local artists adopted this name and became known as the Wonderland Way Art Club of which you will hear Kathy and Don speak. We are so grateful for the relationships we have been able to develop with the Smiths and for their incredible generosity to the campus. And we look forward to seeing this collection continue to grow and help preserve the rich history of the art of our region. At this time, I would like to introduce the seventh chancellor of Indiana University Southeast, Dr. Ray Wallace. Thank you, Kirk. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this blustery, rainy day to celebrate an exciting milestone for IU Southeast. Today, we publicly recognize the generosity of Don and Kathy Smith and share with each of you our excitement as we kick off a project that will change the face of this campus. The 10 paintings you will see to my right are just part of the first phase of building the James L. Russell Wonderland Way collection. In phase two, you'll see dozens more works from the Smiths and we're hoping from other collectors as well. Having this collection on campus will allow students to study incredibly talented regional artists. But this collection has the potential to reach beyond our students. It will allow residents local schools, and people from inside and outside the Louisville metro area to be part of the art community here at IU Southeast. They'll be able to see this historically and, cu and culturally significant body of work. And this body of work will put IU Southeast on the map as an educational and arts tourist attraction. We couldn't be more eager to house this collection on our campus and look forward to preserving it for generations to come. I'd like to personally thank Don and Kathy for their tremendous generosity and for their dedication to our campus and our community. These artists were truly talented and deserve to be recognized and remembered. 
They've captured a piece of what our community was like more than a century ago, both in the scenery they depict and the stories they told. And that is something we are honored to be part of here at IU Southeast. This would not be possible without the generosity of Don and Kathy Smith. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. What began, what began as a conversation in our Ogle Center lobby between Kyle Riddell and the Smiths about our large white walls needing some life <laughs> has turned into an initiative that will serve this region for generations to come. I would like to now introduce the family who has made this all possible. Through their vision and leadership, the Smiths have given selflessly to ensure the history of our community is preserved through art. Please welcome Kathy Russell Smith and Don Smith. You want to start? No. <laughs> she won't start. <laughs> I guess uh, I'm Don Smith, and my wife and I have spent over 50 years collecting the collection, which most of us still are our home. We have about 600 pieces of art. It got to be kind of crazy, you know, I mean, some people collect stamps, some people collect whatever. We, uh, we started collecting art uh, 50 years ago and have been in almost every state of the United States finding this stuff. Uh, when art gets to be 100 years old, you know, Mr. Russell, her grandfather would, and grandmother would give a piece of art during the Depression to a newlywed couple as a, as a gift. And it became, in those people's minds, a very, very... Uh, wonderful gift and they kept them and passed them on to their kids and their grandkids and of course the way people started moving with companies and whatnot they're in California Florida they're everywhere and every once in a while we get an email saying is this really a James L Russell piece or a Kremitz or because there were about 300 artists that painted together over a period of about 30 years in in New Albany and, and it wasn't a formal, the one way wasn't formal, like there was no dues, there was no, you know, there was paperwork, there were minutes for meetings and whatnot, but, <clears throat> but people like, uh, like William Forsyth, who's one of the Hoosier group out of Indianapolis, I mean, people like that were members, and, and, it, and they would learn from each other uh, by having meetings, usually on a Saturday at Mr. Russell's art shop, they would all meet there, and they would bring their new creations in and hang them on the wall, then they would critique each other. Like, you get too much blue in here, you should have done this, more light, whatever. And Mr. Russell was the noted authority on color and, and uh, uh, what's the other word they use? Uh, CW Money uses it all the time. Uh, so, it's, so we've been collecting those folks as we found out. We were at the, I'm jumping around here, but we were at the Indiana Room at the Floyd County Library yesterday trying to find something. And Steve Anschutz, who kind of runs the place, said, have you ever heard of this Phelps guy who was in the one and away? We had never, ever heard that name in all the research and stuff we've done. And he said, well, I happen to have four paintings of his at home. I said, Do what? <laughs> and he had the, all the documentation showing that he was, in fact, a member and whatnot. And Dr. Pat Hess, who some of maybe you in the front don't know, but uh, a lot of you guys in the back that are from around here, I mean, he was the pediatrician for almost everybody, including her, uh, for, you know, for a lot of time. He was an artist, and he collected art, and he, he befriended this Phelps guy. And that, that's how Anschutz found out about him, because during the Depression and the flood and the war and all that, you know, art was like 13th on anybody's list of, of things to do. Uh, you know, they had to feed their family and pay the mortgage and what have you. So, so art wasn't predominant then. And, and our goal is, is to bring this stuff back alive so those folks uh, that were truly as good as anybody in Europe uh, are finally recognized. In fact, Peter Morin, who used to be the director of the Speed Museum, comes to our house and just stares at this art. And uh, he said of Mr. Russell, now he was looking at one of James L. Russell's paintings. He said, you know, Don, this man was as good as Monet or Degas. The problem was he never made it to New York or to Europe. Had he done so, he'd be right in that list. And and that's quite a compliment, to be honest with you. So it's it's been a it's been an absolute incredible journey.
collecting this stuff. And seeing you guys in the front, young, the younger generation, take note, believe me, because this, this stuff gets to you after a while. <laughs> it really does. Go. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I think one of the things that we really wanted was to have it preserved and have it preserved here because these artists were Southern Indiana people and they loved this area. They loved the city. They loved the knobs. They loved the surrounding area and they painted. They went out and painted plain air there. And we thought what better place to have it seen by the people in Southern Indiana than the university because that will bring people in but also keep them in, a, their, in people's mind's eye in the future. 100 years ago, that seems like a long time, but um, it has been that long, and uh, we want them to be remembered for the talent that they had, and what better place than our university here. I think that's okay. <laughs> and we you. thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you both for spearheading this. Very much, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Kathy and Don. You have made an invaluable contribution to our community that will preserve this important piece of Southern Indiana history, and for that we are all grateful. At this time, we would like to open the floor for any questions. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> it was really my grandmother that started it. She gave us one of my grandfather's paintings, and it's one of them on the wall, as a wedding gift. And she said, this is one of your grandfather's, but there's a lot of artists that were working in this area that you need to collect, and therefore you should start right now. You're first married. So we did. We took it seriously, and we started to see who was in this group and, and get uh, samples of their we tried to buy them or wherever oh, yeah. we could get them Auctions. and put them up on the walls and it it's been a lifelong passion for both of us to collect them and it's been fun it's not it hasn't been a, a hard thing to do we've really really enjoyed it but uh it's a it's a personal thing some people collect stamps or whatever <laughs> ours is happen to be wall painting ours are a little more expensive than stamps <laughs> but. Uh, other questions do you know how many artists um, collectively have painted in this? In the, in the one way, about 300, 301, we found another one yesterday. So, <laughs> but, you know, you have to understand back in those days, you know, there was, there was no movie theaters. There was no, you know, people either went to church or they, you know, they, they uh, had, did plays. In fact, Mr. Russell, most people don't know this, was a pretty good actor. They would have plays in Glenwood Park up here in the east side of New Albany. Uh, and they would, you know, they would spend a lot of time rehearsing and so forth, and then the public would come in and they would do, do their plays. So art became the pastime of a lot of people. And again, they, it wasn't a formal invitation or membership thing, even though they kept track of whatnot. And they would have shows in the Speed Museum, at the Hoosier Salon in Chicago. I mean, they, they, would, they, they would have shows everywhere. But it never got the media hype because they just, people wrote about them in Chicago because we have, we have those newspapers today, but, but it, what, it didn't get press like this is getting, is what I'm trying to say. There was no internet, it was, you know. So I don't know if that's answered your question, but there was a lot of people, some women, uh, and I don't think there were any men, but some women, you know, their art expression was in painting China and they were members of the one Room way. And we don't have any representation pieces of, their, of that stuff here yet, but, but there were all kinds of artists, sculptures, uh, what have you. Most of them painted in oil. We think over the period that this was, it, it was really a little after 37, after my grandfather died, that, that it kind of fell apart. But uh, over all the period of those years, we think there were like 300 in there at different times over all those years. Maybe all of them weren't in all those times, but uh, it was quite a group. And as the collection grows here at uh, IU Southeast, you'll, you'll get to see quite a number of those people. Sure, there's more questions. <laughs> Kyle? <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about portrait work versus landscapes? 
Yeah, uh, from from our knowledge, not that we're art professors, we're not, but uh, a lot, most of the first artists, first fine art artists in any area of the country were portraiture artists. And the reason they painted portraitures, there were no cameras. I mean, they they were they were you know documenting a person's face or, or family or whatnot, and they made a living doing that. They made a living most. I say rich people, I guess all kinds of people did it, but uh, a lot of rich folks from the governor on down had their portraiture done. And that, that was, the older the, the older the artist, the more portraitures they did. I'll put it that way. Uh, today we have people that are around here like John Michael Carter, who's probably the preeminent portraiture artist. He does all the governors and state senators and whatnot. Uh, he's also a terrific landscape uh, painter. So today, percentage-wise, is probably probably of the artists we know, 10% of what they do is is portraiture work, and then maybe another 20% is what they call figurative. And all that means is, if you remember the John Michael Carter in our entry hall with the lady in the in the lake negligee with a cup of tea, looking at a canary in a bird cage. That's a figurative. That's really not a portrait of that person. It's a figurative showing something happening. So, and then in the landscapes and still lifes, and it goes on and on and on. So, does that answer your question? Good. You have some good portraitures. <laughs> question right at the back. Oh yes, uh, ones like, and and here's here's what you have to understand when when people. When an artist got really good, uh, most of them were born in Indiana, believe it or not. Uh, but like Carl Brenner was born here, moved to Louisville, because that's where the population was. He did portraitures, a lot of portraitures. Harvey Jarner was born in Charleston, Indiana. He moved to Louisville because there was a group of very wealthy ladies that kind of, in, they liked what he did, and they, they bought all his frames for him out of Chicago. He had these big, really, not gaudy, but just, Ornate. ornate frames and they would buy the frames for him ahead of time he would paint and if you didn't have a Harvey Jarner most of his were like a long narrow over your buffet in your dining room you weren't anybody <laughs> so there was like a craze Every, in fact he had to set up assembly lines to paint I mean, he really did he used students to help paint you know painting trees and stuff <laughs> because he sold so many pieces and today there are thousands of Har Harvey Joiners in, in, in Louisville homes because of that. Uh, but, but Kentucky claims him too because he moved over there. Uh, but there was Patty Thumb. Uh, I don't know if you, if you go to the Speed Museum, you'll see some of her pieces. She was excellent. Uh, Carl Christ uh, Christian Brenner. And then Brenner had two sons, Carlos and Proctor Knott. I mean, there, 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 are, there are a lot of them, but there, most of them were actually Indiana people. Kentucky's just, it's not a hotbed. Indi Indiana has more art collectors in it than I think the state of New York. If you get up in, around Indianapolis and Brown County, Nashville, you will not believe the, what people spend in art. It's just, it's incredible. So we're glad we're finally joining the state and doing our thing. <laughs> we're glad to. The southern, the southern area. Did I answer your question? Good. Question. Aside from your original painting that was your wedding gift from your grandmother, do you have a favorite piece in the collection? Well, yeah, she does. Hmm. Well, snow scene. Hmm? The snow scene. I don't want to answer your question, but I think it's a snow scene. <laughs> yeah, there, there's one, but it was the last one he painted, and that's why it's, it's personal. I don't one know of, that one it was, of the last. Yeah, one, one of the last ones, but um, it's hard. It's almost like your children, you know, each one, when you have a story that goes with it, you know. It's, it's really hard. I'm very fond of my uncle, James J. Russell's. Um, I, Don says, don't call it the nude man. It's a male it's a figure. It's a male torso. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ma uh, torso. That's down on the wall down there. I, I, I think that one's really, really good. And we'll be asking you. Yeah. After you start favorite? looking at these, we'll be asking all of you, what, what's your favorite? And as the collection grows, your favorite will change, I bet. Oh, yeah. You had mentioned that the collection mainly, I guess, mainly consists 
the forfeiture work in landscape, or are there any sort of abstract pieces that uh, maybe stand out in the collection? Or uh, they didn't do abstract back then. They got close to it. If you see the, there's an Orville Carroll. He was one of the younger Wandering Away artists. Uh, it's called Beeler Point. It's about the fourth one down, starting here on the, on the corner. It's it's, it's extreme impressionism, which actually started before uh, uh, abstract. abstract. <laughs> and, and, and a lot of people look at it and think it's an abstract, but, but you can tell. That there's the bridge in downtown New Albany. You, you can tell. But that back then, impressionism was the thing. They were copying the, the European change from realism to, to, to impressionism. We just happen to like impressionism. Yeah, yes, we do. Yeah. Pat Hess? Yeah, his, his is more what he's talking abstract. about. Yeah, abstract. Yeah. Do you, do you do Dr. Pat Hess? He just died here not too long ago. But, um, and he, we will have a piece of his in this. We'll have, we're trying to find, in case any of you know, we're trying to find, initially at least, uh, if this is okay, if I mention this sure. law, uh, we'd like to find one small piece. Small pieces are easier to get than big pieces. People will give up a you know, small jewel. We'd like to have as many of the 300 one Away artists represented in a small piece, and they all did them, on this wall behind me, once we get out of the way, along with this, this banner. So when you walk in, you can see everyone represented that we can possibly find, even though we may not have a large piece yet. Our goal is, is, is to get these about 300 pieces on these walls right here so people can just see the differences in, in the way folks painted. There was a guy, I'm going to add this because he, he have, he's never, never gets talked about, but there was a black man in the one in the way named Alfred Shoe Davis. And he was a shoeshine man. That's how he made his living. He lived out, it was, it was called Jefferson Woods or Jefferson Gardens. Gardens. Here, it's gone now, uh, it's subdivisions or whatever. But uh, the Speed Museum found him. Uh, it's been at least 45 years ago. We were having breakfast and opened the Sunday paper, and there was this, and they didn't use much color back then. Uh, and there was these colored, three or four pages of colored pictures of paintings by Shu Davis. And the Speed Museum found this primitive artist. You know, it was a big deal. And <laughs> we were already collecting then, so I said, pack the kids up. We had two, two children then. We're going to find this guy. So we drove out and started asking about where Shoe Davis lived, out around Jefferson Gardens, and found him. And he, he lived in this cabin. Uh, and, and when you walked in, he had paintings stacked all around the house, around every wall. And he was getting ready for the Speed to come and get those. And, and the Speed actually sold his paintings for a number of years. So make a long story short, we, he, he was, he's a very good primitive artist. And we have a piece coming here. Uh, but he said, I would like for you all to have a piece in your collection. And I said, fine, how much, how much is it? Just tell me what it is. We'd like to buy three or four. We could. We ended up buying four. And he said, look, he was eight, I think he was 87, something like that. He said, I'm not going to be around long, and I want to make sure some of this stuff is saved. He says, if you go to Kroger store and get me a pack of Camel cigarettes and two, two watermelons, watermelons. <laughs> this, was, this was like the 3rd of July. He said, I'm, we're having a, a family, family yeah. gathering for the 4th of July out here in the lot. He called it the lot, like a barnyard area. Uh, and he said, that's really all I want. And, 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 and somehow we ended up giving him $5 along with that. So we ended up with some incredible paintings. Uh, and th those are probably the cheapest we ever bought <laughs> from Shoe Davis. And I just want to make sure he's recognized in this whole thing because he was, he was a very, just a, just a great gentleman and uh, never showed anywhere. He just kept him in his cabin. But the Speed Museum found him, and, and now they want to buy back the ones that we bought. <laughs> Art, art's a good thing. Yes, sir. themselves behind the doors. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, this is yours. Well, the, the, there was, there's another female nude uh, that may join this group, may not. We'll see. It belongs to our son. But anyway, the, the male tarsal back there, 
those two were done by my Uncle Jim in art school in, in Louisville. And because they had to learn how to paint the body, you know, the human body, that was part of it. Well, my Uncle Jim brought them home and gave them to his mother. And of course, that would have been 1930, maybe. She said, oh, they're wonderful. She rolled the canvases up, put them behind the door in the closet. So when he got married, she got, took those two out and gave them to his wife as a gift. These are yours now. So she looked at them and she said, oh, those are wonderful. And she rolled them up and put them behind the door in the closet. <laughs> no nudes. So years later, it was in 2000, we were trying to do a the Carnegie Center in New Orleans was going to do a show of the father and the son. And we were trying to figure out which paintings to be put in there. And Mary said, well, there are two other ones that I don't think you all have seen. They were rolled up behind the door in the garage of their home. And this is an old house in an old garage. So Don went out and got them and brought them in and we unrolled them. And of course they were really dirty. But we took one look at them and thought, these are really good. So we had them cleaned and framed. The, the mail is down here, you'll see it, and it's really good. But sometimes things just turn up. You don't know that they're there and they just appear. Right. <laughs> and so there could be, who knows, there could be surprises down the road of, of things that you know well, we haven't seen tell yet. Tell about Cora Weems. Oh, those, we, those were found accidentally um, up in Silver Hills in an attic. This one they were woman's. stuffed up in the rafters of this house. This attic. But she never liked to sell her pieces. She always kept them. And if she gave you one or sold one, she'd come back a few months later and buy it back from you because she didn't want it out of her sight, I guess. So anyway, they ended up uh, in, a in the attic, and these people that bought the house had no idea what they were or who she was. And we ended up buying quite a few of those because we knew she was in this group. And uh, that's how we kicked came by her so we don't know there could be a lot more out there that we haven't seen <laughs> coming up at the check your attics <laughs> yeah you just never know right. yeah yes you know, that's the, in the collection that we have here so far that the, the paintings are rich in color and texture and there seems to be a particular aesthetic or a strain of thought in the work but i noticed in the collection there are also both unique prints which are very graphic I wonder if you can talk about your decisions in acquiring those pieces and bringing those into this collection of paintings. Are you talking about woodcuts? And yeah. yeah, we have, there's, how many are down there? There's maybe 20 woodcuts that we ha actually have to frame yet. There, there were, most of those were done by Grover Page Sr., who was the cartoonist. For the Courier Journal. The, uh, the graphic artist for the, for the Courier Journal for years. And we knew his son, who was also in the one room way, and some of his pieces would be here. So those, and then there's there's one his dad is called Conquest. Are you going to give that to him? I don't know. <laughs> Conquest, I'm not sure. <laughs> we, have, we have these ones that are that are like, nobody else has anything like them. And they, those are the ones that really should be out here. So they are preserved. So to answer your question, yes, there are a number of, of uh, of uh, wood blocks and uh, pen and inks in our collection, and but we're planning on putting those in like collages, or we're putting maybe five or six, or not us, but Sherry will design collages of those because they kind of go together, as opposed to putting one at a time. That makes sense. Okay. All right. Thank you all so much for being here. If there are no other questions, I invite you to take a look at our James L. Russell Wonderland Way collection, and feel free to also walk around our theaters. Um, the Stiefler Recital Hall will be open if you would like to speak with any of our panelists one-on-one. -on -one. And again, I would just like to thank everyone for being here and, uh, and express our, yes, done. Sherry. Sherry Rouse, our campus <laughs> art curator for IU is here. Um, please feel free to ask her questions as well. And we just like to express our sincere gratitude and appreciation. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you very Thank much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. This is great. Thank you so much. Okay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>